You are now listening to Chakras and Shotguns. Welcome to Chakras and Shotguns, the podcast that guides you on your journey of spiritual development and personal preparedness. I'm Jen. I used to be a lawyer. Now I'm a wellness entrepreneur, tarot card reader, and human design reader. And I'm Mick, a marketer, energy healer, and prepper. So Jen and I, not too long ago, we watched the movie on Netflix, Leave the World Behind. Mm. There's a scene in the movie where one of the characters gets really sick. They're in need of emergency services, any antibiotics, something like teeth are falling out. It gets real crazy. So we were thinking about that and we want to ask you guys, what would you do in that situation? And what would you want to make sure you have on hand now so that if you ever were in that situation, you would be prepared to take care of, of that emergency? Yeah. So today we are welcoming to the show Dr. Adrian Basklo Hightower. He is an emergency medical doctor and he's going to talk to us about things that you can have on hand just in case there is an emergency and you need to have some medical preparedness tools ready for you. Yeah. And as part of that conversation with Dr. Hightower, we talked about prescriptions, other types of medical supplies that you should stock up on in case of an emergency situation. And that can easily send you into a panic, especially Mm -hmm. if you have prescriptions that you normally take day to day. If an emergency situation happens for a few days or even longer, what are you going to do? So there's actually a really great company called Jace Medical. They have a product called the Jace Case that has emergency antibiotics in it, which can be very, very helpful because usually we need antibiotics from the doctor. And they also have something called Jace Daily where you provide them with your prescriptions and they will give you a 12 month supply. So you have an emergency stash on hand, which I find phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You can actually get $10 off if you buy any of their products using our code Mick and Jen. That's M-I-K-A-N-D-J-E-N-N. Jen has two N's. Okay, guys. (laughs) And so, yeah, check them out and get the $10 off. All right. Let's begin as we always do with a little bit of breath work meditation to put us into a mindful place. All right. Go ahead and find a comfortable seat. You can always lie down and let's begin. Place your hands somewhere on your body, face down. We're going to be in a grounding energy today. You can do your belly or your heart, somewhere on your legs, wherever feels most comfortable for you. And let's start by connecting with our breath. So inhale deeply in through your nose. Hold at the top. And exhale your breath back out through your mouth. Hold on empty. Inhale in through your nose. Hold. And exhale back out through your mouth. Let's do one more together. Inhale in through your nose. Hold. And this time, exhale your breath back out through your nose. Start to inhale and exhale, breathing normally. Maybe play around with the length of your inhales and your exhales. And just focus on your breath and my voice. With the topic of today's episode, I thought it would be interesting to revisit the root chakra. Root chakra is where we find security, safety. I feel like it's a foundational chakra where having that sense of security can allow the rest of the chakras to blossom and bloom. I want you to envision a red light surrounding your entire body. Mm. 
and conjure up that feeling of safety. What does that feel like for you? Do you feel held? Do you feel stable? Sit in that emotion. And as we conclude this short little time together, I want you to hold in your mind's eye, in your body, the affirmation that I am safe, I am secure, I am protected. Maybe say that out loud, or you can say it to yourself. See if you can expand and grow those sensations of feeling safe and secure and protected. Take a deep inhale in through your nose. And exhale your breath back out through your mouth. Start to wiggle your fingers, your toes. And slowly blink your eyes open if they were closed. Come back into the room and let's continue with the show. Great job, as always, Boo. Thank you. Appreciate that breath work. Let's introduce our guest. So Dr. Adrian Bosclo Hightower is a senior emergency medical resident at the University of Washington. Adrian holds a combined medical doctorate and master of public health in addition to his undergraduate degree from Stanford University. Most importantly, Adrian is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He's my line brother, and I've known him for over 20 years. So without any further ado, let's get into our conversation with Dr. Hightower. All right. Welcome, Dr. Adrian Boscolo Hightower to the show. I've known him for a long time, mixed on him for a very long time, so he's just Adrian to us, but... Dr. Hightower, thank you for being here with us today. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we were able to make it happen. All right, man. So as Jim mentioned, we've known each other for like 20 years. So I know your background, but I want to give you a moment just to, to flex a little bit, let everybody who's listening know a little bit about who you are and some of your training. Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate that. Well, I'm currently a fourth year emergency medicine resident. Uh, at the University of Washington, but my interest kind of in uh, healthcare and then just emergency preparedness goes back quite a bit of some time. It was a, right after college, I was an EMT, so I did that for about two years, volunteered outside on the East Coast. Then I moved back to Seattle and I was a volunteer firefighter EMT and then got also some training in search and rescue. And so I did that out here around the outside of Seattle. And then afterwards, I went to medical school in Chicago and got a master's in public health. And while I was there, I also joined the Army National Guard, which I'm still uh, a member of today. And as I mentioned, I'm a fourth year emergency medicine resident, kind of looking forward to uh, graduating and seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and, and I'm going to work somewhere in the community. All right. So, I mean, if, it's, if stuff is going down, it's an emergency, you got to go to, right? You, mm -hmm. you know how to, to, to search people, find them, give them some treatment. <laughs> I know a couple of things, you know, a couple of things. The thing that I always like to say, too, is kind of with this stuff is I put a big asterisk next to everything. Right. I have some experience, but I don't have like I'm not a subject matter expert. You know, the thing is, is that there are people who have literally a fellowships in disaster medicine, for instance. And so they have a wealth of background. So I haven't had a, a lot of experience in that area. So everything I say, take it with, a, you know, a grain of salt. It's kind of just based on some of my experiences, some of my medical training and trying to put it all together. I hear you. I hear you being modest, but you, you you do recognize that you have a lot more experience than like us and a lot of people that are listening. Yeah. So fair, fair, for sure, for sure, for sure. I always like to put the asterisk in there. All right. So can you just give us some some basic principles that people should know when it comes to like first aid and emergency situations? Yeah, definitely. I think you know the most important thing we talk about this all the time is like it's training, training, and training. I think a lot of time when we talk about kind of just emergency preparedness just in general, especially like in the medical setting, we talk about, you know, what tools should you have? What should you have on hand? But I would say even before you get to that, it's kind of really uh, taking the time to find some classes and getting some education in terms of what this actually like looks like, right? So there is there's been abundance of like different training programs that have come up 
over the course of like the past like 20 years. And I would say a lot of them that probably most helpful for kind of your listener base are things like an emergency first responder class, uh, emergency like a wilderness first responder class. And those are classes and they're offered by a variety of different types of organizations. National Outdoor Leadership School is a big one, but they go and you kind of spend four or five days learning not only first aid, but how do you apply that context like in a backpacking trip or like a hiking trip or something like that, where you don't have a lot of things. And I think those are good kind of like entry level, kind of just basic knowledge, basic things for people who are kind of interested in this kind of area and want to get some more experience. And then also a variety of different things for kind of around that field in terms of volunteering with local search and rescue folks. I think upwards of 90% of, of county-based search and rescue are volunteer organizations, and they offer a wealth of training and a variety of different things that you can, not only do you help your community, but you also get something from that as well. So that's kind of where I would start is in terms of just like training, training, training. Yeah. I'm like, we took one infant CPR class <laughs> before we had our first kid. Yeah. How like, many CPR? Have you ever taken any other CPR? Oh yeah, classes? in high school I, it was required that I took eight CPR classes. So how many is that? I, I had to take one every year, so four plus <laughs> plus the one with the with, with, with the kid. Four five. about four about twenty five <laughs> years ago. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> no, that that sounds dope. I definitely want to to link that organization in in the, in the episode show notes because I'm interested in taking in taking some training with them. That sounds dope. I didn't realize that that stuff even existed. So that's dope. Yeah. Yeah, and there's and like I said, they're just like one of the more popular like older ones, and then there's Wherever you live, there's some kind of organization that offers some kind of training in, in wilderness first aid. That's what I would really call it. Like, I think that's kind of the, the area where the listener base is probably most interested in. Yeah. So you mentioned search and rescue with like different counties and stuff. And I know that you have experience doing that. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about what that was like? If you had any situations that, you know, were particularly, you know, exciting or interesting or, you know, notable, I would say. You know, of note, I went through the training for it and I went on one or two missions. And a lot of the missions are folks would go the traditional stereotypical mission for a social search and rescue folks or someone goes hiking in the summer and they roll their ankle or something happens where they can't walk anymore. And then that person has to get off of a mountain where you can't just drive a car up to. And so that's like a classic example. And they're usually like on a hike that a lot of people go on. Right. You know, and so they usually don't take a light with them. Like the other basic principles that you don't take a light, they don't, their phone runs out of batteries and stuff like that. And then they kind of went on a mission where we would, there was like a, an elderly person who had Alzheimer's who got lost in their community and there was a forested area. So kind of going through and doing that. But I would say most of my things that I did were like the actual training. So we just do a lot of basic land navigation. I would say probably some of the, the best land navigation I've trained was probably even better than my military training was about how to use a compass and a map, how to delineate like a specific like like route and like how do you follow that route and like doing pacing and like just learn how to read a map. And so it was a lot of training. And then also like a lot of it was just kind of more of like backpacking, kind of like camping. A lot of what we had, we like weren't allowed to use tents. So we had to use a tarp and then, you know, how to set up like a rope and like a tarp. And so kind of just have it like a, with a limited amount of tools, like how do you, can you spend the night outside and do so safely? And then I, I think a lot of what I did for the organization was I was one of their teachers, like their first aid instructors. So everybody who came through, we taught them first aid. Oh, yeah. We were talking about, I was watching a video about how our phones are like part of us now. Like we can't part from our phones. Yeah. And like you talking about looking at a map. I grew up with maps go, mm -hmm. but like our kids will have no, no idea. concept of what that is like naturally of like doing like the K4 and yeah, figuring out better. where you're going and all of that. So yeah, it's like, those are, those are skills that we don't think about as yeah. much my dad had the the orange key map joint like when oh. we were like you know before gps he was like we're trying to go to this this park and he was like we got to find it on the key map like and we were over here trying to figure it out then they the kids probably have no idea what that is like figuring out a route yeah that's crazy they can barely do a maze or even like taking map quest directions <laughs> and i'm gonna print them out and then yeah. <laughs> and bring yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's a different area we're just dating ourselves now <laughs> yeah so i feel like it's like this new exercise when we think about preparedness is like stripping away the conveniences yeah. and like we're going backwards in time yeah and then like you stop and you're like well in the 80s nobody had yeah. a phone in their car or gps yeah. or any of those things mm -hmm. i want to go back to something you said about the search and rescue. So you were like, people go hiking, and they don't bring a light. And mm -hmm. so like, I realized when I've gone hiking, cause I'm going during the daytime, I don't bring a light. You know, I'm obviously not planning on having an injury that leaves me outside for hours past sunset. Mm -hmm. So are there other things like when you're hiking, other than the light, maybe that we need to make sure we have on hand 
in case there's an, an emergency, like, you, you know, you need to contact search and rescue. For sure. A couple of things that I would always say, you know, when it comes to emergency preparedness is like uh, communication is your most important tool, right? So that's a, have a fully charged phone. You can just start with that, like having a good fully charged, fully charged phone. And then the other things too, are I always carry a headlamp, right? So for me, it's a headlamp. Another thing too, is I always have like a little mirror too, because another like best way to good communicate is just like you can signal an aircraft really easily with that. And so kind of, or even just like, like a, one of those like pop, like uh, lights too, that you can, uh, I forgot what those little lights called that you can like pop it on an end of string glow stick and you can wave that like all like so forms of communication but the other like the fundamentals that i say are like water right you know having a sufficient amount of water having even just like a couple of snacks to like an energy bar and then in terms of uh, the other things too just having like rain gear right and having like at least like some kind of like layer that you can wear on top that's warm even if you're going for the day and then always an emergency blanket too I think that's like another crucial aspect if you have to spend the day outside or just like a night outside is having some kind of like blanket. Like we're not talking about a lot of stuff. We're just talking about the basics. Yeah. So I recommend all those things for like having in your cars, like a a pack in case like your car breaks down. But I never thought about it as like something I need to take with me on a hike in case like Mm -hmm. I roll an ankle and like I'm out there. You know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. That hadn't come across my mind. That's news to me. You don't have a light out there. (laughs) You're just out there, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about like medical gear and first aid kits. I know we, you and I had a conversation a while back and we were like, you know, there's a lot of stuff in first aid kits that you don't really need. And so I'd love for you to just kind of share some of that knowledge with the folks about like what's important to have for, for medical gear for emergency situations. You know, my, my thought process is always like start with the basics. And I take that lesson back. So I remember when we went to, you know, went to South Africa in 2010 for the World Cup. Yeah. I did a lot of research before that time and I brought like a, like a decently bulky, like, emergency kit. I mean, I had your basics like your band-aids and tweezers and I had your like powders if you get like dehydrated. I think I even like found got a hold of some stitches and put things in there. So I carried this like bulky thing around with me throughout South like East Africa, you know, for literally like 6 weeks. And then afterwards I had this realization where I was like, man, I didn't use any of this stuff. And so from there, I've kind of like taken it back and like I say, how do I build like my first aid kits uh, for travel? That's kind of how I think about it. And then I think I like I build up from there, right? So like the first thing, like even I went and got like my first aid kit and you know, some of the basics that I have on there for when I travel, for me it's like stuff that I know I need. So for instance, I know I get colds really easily, right? And so for me, I carry like basic stuff in there. So I always have Tylenol and ibuprofen. And then I have just like basic stuff for colds. And instead of using like something like VIX or just it's like multi, like this is for everything you can use, like just use something specifically for a decongestion, right? Or just like Sudafed or just something that like Claritin that can like open up your nostrils. So like, so like basic medications, over-the-counter med- medications for me is something that I always have. For me also, my nuggets get plugged up. It's terrible. I feel terrible. So I have that little Afrin spray you can spray in your nose to get everything. So for me, that's like fundamental. Anytime I travel, it's like in my bag. And then my first aid kit, I have just like the basics, to be honest with you. I find that I use most frequently are Band-Aids, like just simple different types of sizes of Band-Aids and Neosporin, right? Like you cut a hand and that can just like that little cut just like messes you up and have been able to cover that up. In addition to like those also those medications that I mentioned, I realized that traveling overseas, it is like really easy to find like antibiotics. Like you can go to a pharmacy anywhere overseas and just like over the counter, they just give you antibiotics. But sometimes it's actually hard to find like those medications for like a cough or like a Tylenol and different things like that. So those are kind of like the, just the medication wise. And then I always have a pair of like gloves on me. Uh, I use tweezers. I think those things are like super, super helpful getting stuff, digging stuff out of your hand. And then also stuff for your feet, like foam, uh, different small pair of scissors so I can cut that for blisters. Cause those are the things that even for an emergency situation or that you might have access to, those could be uh, a game changer. Got it. So I think that's great for like travel, right? Like you're going somewhere and you want to make sure you have like some emergency supplies on hand. But like, what if you live somewhere where there's like, you know, terrible snowstorms or tornadoes, hurricanes, you know, these big natural disasters where you may be stuck at home and you may need to have some some medical gear on hand for, you know, more serious things. Maybe someone falls while they're outside and, and gets banged up pretty bad or whatever and you can't get to the ER. Like, what are some gear that you would like keep in like a bag in your closet 
for these type of situations where maybe you can, you know, have more than just like the bandages and, and little packets of, of, of medicine, you can, you know, there's room for more stuff. Like what would you put in that? Yeah. And so like, as I talked about, even for like travel and even for emergency preparedness, like those are like the fundamentals. And then I kind of like build off of that. Right. Yeah. And so I think like the next step that like is helpful are two components. One is for those trips and falls that like everybody that people like might have. So other big things that I think of are just basic like ACE wraps, like larger like ACE wrap and just bandages. You never have like enough ACE wraps and just bandages just in general. And then tape, like like medical tape is like very, very helpful. And then we start talking about like other things just to have in the house. The other thing that you, it would be like a failure for us to mention is having enough prescription medications on hand, like inside your house. You don't think about that enough, right? Like having 90 days of your prescription medication, because in an emergency scenario, you know, especially if you take insulin, if you have like other like different things, you can't get to a hospital or healthcare center, you need to have enough and being able to store that if it needs to be in a refrigerator for, you know, at least seven to 10 days, but really having a 90 day supply on hand of any prescription medications. Can't say that enough. And then kind of, I think about, you know, those other things. So if like someone falls and they have a fracture of like their arm or their leg, there's these things called SAM splints that you can buy. But those are, I would say those are helpful with a little bit of training and just some basic idea. You can kind of figure out how to set those up. If you kind of break your arm or if you break your leg or even your pelvis, for instance, there's those things. And then I would say also too, when I start thinking about, you know, like the additional things that I have like in, in the house, it really depends on kind of your level of training and what you might have access to. So sometimes it says, you know, for me, I know that I know how to do laceration repairs and uh, laceration repairs. I'll honestly say it's a cosmetic thing, but it's more about like, you know, how do I take like the thing that's going to be life saving or how do I save your limb is like keeping a wound clean. Right. So if you fall and you have a really big cut on your leg, like you getting stitches isn't going to be the game changer for you. You like spraying like a lot of water in there and like clearing out that wound that's going to be like the most important thing for doing that. So keeping like a water bottle that I can just poke holes in, in the top of and like cleaning a wound under pressure is like most important. And then being able to like wrap that up. Right. And then from there, maybe having like some, some antibiotics that might be helpful that cover a variety of different things. And what those things are probably going to be are, are you going to develop pneumonia for instance? So having an antibiotic that covers for like pneumonia or having an antibiotic that covers for like a skin infection. And those are kind of like the big things that I think about, like just in general. And then as well as, you know, if again, based on your medical training, or if you run into somebody who does have like medical training, have a stuff to like start an IV and like IV fluids. But I'll honestly say that those things are much further down the line. Okay, cool, cool. I, I wanted to, to drop in a company that I, I know of called Jace Medical. You mentioned the the antibiotics and you mentioned having prescription medicines on hand. And this company, Jace Medical, basically they have a couple of different products. One is a case that comes with kind of basic antibiotics that you can have on hand. I think it's like five different antibiotics that you can have on hand. And then the second, they have a, another product where you can actually tell them all the prescriptions that you uh, have, you know, that you need for whatever conditions that you have, like diabetes or asthma or whatever it is, and they'll provide prescription medication for you so you can have that on hand. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a good resource for folks if you're interested in getting some of that. Yeah, that sounds like a really good option. You were talking about all the antibiotics and I was like, how do you get those? Because usually you get prescribed antibiotics and the doctor or the nurse or the nurse practitioner is like, and take every single one. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you can't really hoard them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're usually prescription. I've gotten antibiotics at a Thai airport before, mm -hmm. but in the US, it's kind of hard to get Got your idea. hands on them. For sure. For sure. Other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, around pregnancy. So when Jen was pregnant, we actually had an ice storm right around like the the end of her pregnancy, like nine, nine months, like almost to like the last week, I think it was when the, when the ice storm was was hitting. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of was preparing like she's going to be giving birth in the winter. So I went and bought one of these like little kits that had like some some scissors, surgical scissors for cutting the umbilical cord and like some ties and, and everything. So I, I don't know if I was being extra, but I don't know if you have any any tips for stuff people should get if they're kind of in that same situation. I think it really just like depends on what you are, like what you're getting ready for, right? If you have like somebody who's like pregnant at home or something like that, like having like a, like an OB like delivery kit, like might be like somewhat helpful, but I can't stress enough the idea of, you know, it's helpful to have those tools on hand, but if you haven't done a little bit of training to have an idea of like what to do when it happens, like that stuff is not useful. I'm gonna be really honest with you because you can open it up and be like, what am I gonna do with this stuff? So so I think it really just depends on like someone's like situation in terms of, you know, what scenario do you most 
likely think you're going to be in, right? But the other thing we haven't, that I haven't really mentioned yet, which I think is important, especially for today's day and age, are like basic kits that you have for like very traumatic injuries. And so like what that means, so if we talk about like traumatic injuries, we talk about like gunshot wounds is like a major thing that we like think about, right? Or some kind of like puncture wound where some object like goes into the chest or like something where you sever like an artery and you need to control that bleeding, right? And so there has been a tremendous amount of research and information that's come over out really within the past 25 years uh, with the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan and a lot of people have lost their lives for it's really kind of emerged in the field of like tactical combat casualty care. And that's something that's, that's kind of developed in the military, but it's definitely come over to the civilian side. And I would say that some people might have heard like things like Stop the Bleed campaign. And that's and then also like if you go to like major like malls or if you go to the airport next to the AED, you'll notice that there's like a, a, a bleeding or a hemorrhage kit. And pretty much what those are, are for if you're in situations where uh, someone suffers a significant injury, the most likely reason they're going to die is because they lose too much blood. And so a lot of training goes into, that's why tourniquets are super, super helpful and knowing how to use them and where to place them to really save somebody's life in the short term. So there's tourniquets, then there's like just applying pressure and packing a wound, and then some more advanced skills of, you know, how would you put a needle in someone's chest if they have uh, what's called a pneumothorax or a out of their lungs. So there are all that to say is it, it sounds like, you know, we start mentioning these things. It's like, man, I'm never going to be in that scenario. But having knowing how to use a tourniquet, for instance, is changes live like on the street. If someone gets shot or someone gets in a car accident and they are have a significant amount of bleeding. And so those are other things that I have on hand also, like in my car, like in my house. Yeah, t- tourniquet, definitely something that we have in our first aid kit. When I did a wilderness training, I guess it was 2022 into 2022, I did a whole like we did a whole workshop where we basically apply tourniquets to different you know, different parts of our bodies like leg, arm. So definitely know how important that is. Just going back to the whole pregnancy kit thing though, my my plan, you know, I had the kit. My plan was, you know, I was going I was going to hit up somebody on Facetime or call, you know, whether that was you or the, or the OB or whoever I can get get on the line, like walk me through this. All right, <laughs> so. I went out. I went out here just wild. I didn't want to have to be out here with the with the, the shoelace and trying to like tie the shoelace. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so yeah. Oh man. All right. So I'm still on pills. So <laughs> I got my wisdom teeth out in 2011. Yeah. I probably still have that hydrocodone. Like I was like, oh, I might need this for something, and I saved it. But like, how old is too old? It has, it has when no do we need to let it go? <laughs> So that's a good question. And I tried to research this question a while back because I had the same one. And uh, there is like no good data that says, oh, you know, after like, it's, it's, it's definitely well beyond the expiration date that it says on the bottle. Right. So it's definitely like well beyond that. And I would, I, I don't know. I, and again, this is not based like off of like a, like I can't cite a specific article, but I comfortably have things in the house that are like five years old. Right. And I think it should be okay. Right. I think if you start pushing 10 years, is probably not as good anymore. Like that's, you might be like, you might be like outside the window, but if that's all you got, that's all you got. The only other thing I would ask about in the travel kit, the one thing that I, that we used to take very seriously in our travels, stomach integrity. This is what mm-hmm, we're always mm-hmm. talking about, stomach integrity. <laughs> is there anything in your kit that, you know, if you get an upset stomach, diarrhea, was it upset yeah. stomach, heartburn, <laughs> di- you know, indigestion, anything like that that you would add to your kit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me, it's always like I got some in there too, like some the Pepto Bismol, like pills, you know, some like Imodium. Like that's another thing. The other thing, as I always just can't really with me, is like some Ciprofloxacin. And so we always call it like traveler's diarrhea is always like the main thing that always like comes up. And to be clear from like a medical perspective, you know, traveler's diarrhea, like diarrhea that's not bloody, is you do not need to treat that with antibiotics, right? And especially for ones that it is like bloody, that's even concerning that there might be like some other like process going on, which you should not take like antibiotics for. Right. And that's like the, that's like the medical hat in me, you know, but at the same time, like I have some in my kit because I've been in that situation before where I felt absolutely terrible and I started taking antibiotics and I felt a lot better. So break that down a little bit. Cause I, I've been in a similar situation. I think I was, I was in a trip to Turkey and, it, and the stomach integrity was just not there until I got back and got some, some antibiotics. So what, what is the recommended treatment for that? If it's not antibiotics? Yeah. So the recommended treatment is just hydration actually. Yeah. It's just hydration. Like, you know, the, 
the only problem that diarrhea is going to cause you like large volumes of diarrhea is like getting dehydrated, right? So if you're able to keep up with a large volume of fluid that you can drink with electrolytes, you're okay, right? Because you're going to get better traditionally, you know, 99 times out of 100 over the next course of like a couple of days. It's going to suck, but you're going to be better. So that's kind of like the the recommended treatment is not to treat with antibiotics. They're not indicated. That's the like the official answer. Got it, got it. But yeah, it's really just, just like we call it symptomatic treatment in the in the healthcare world. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Let's talk a little bit about these kids, man. You know, we got two, you a new dad as well, got a little infant at this point. Are there any special considerations from just like gear, medical stuff that we should have on hand? You know, if, if stuff hits the fan and it's like, all right, I got I to gotta make it do what it do with these little kids, like what should we have on hand? Yeah, so I'm doing emergency medicine. I also spend about 25% of my time working in pediatrics because you have to have an idea about kids. And so the things that I've realized that can save a kid's life, like in the short term, if you don't access to a hospital, one is an EpiPen. And so having like an EpiPen on hand for an allergic reaction can save a life. Just flat out, you know, it's because that's something that you, if you don't have, can't get to emergency services quickly. And if someone hasn't, uh, anaphylactic reaction or an allergic reaction to something that can kill them and having that on hand is a game changer. And then the other thing too, especially for when kids get sick, a lot of times they can have what's called reactive airway disease. And that's where they might get a cold, but then they get like having a lot of problems, difficulty breathing. You know, I believe that one of your little ones had this when they, you had to take them to the hospital and they had to get a lot of breathing treatments. Right. And so having like albuterol at like a, like puff, like albuterol at home, with a little mask that you can give them can really kind of delay kind of it potentially getting worse. They'll probably still need to get more treatment, but having those two things that just come to mind, like right off, right off the top are things that like having a new one that I would probably have in my house or an EpiPen and then having some kind of albuterol, even if they haven't had needed in the past, a lot of kids haven't needed it. They just got sick and all of a sudden their, their breathing has gotten significantly worse. And really what we just do is we treat them with a lot of albuterol in the emergency department. And then steroids, there's also a place for steroids. And I'm not saying that I would keep steroids necessarily in the house, but albuterol in the short term and then definitely some an EpiPen. All right, man. We're good there. I know, right? <laughs> got plenty of that. All right. Well, Adrian, man, I appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us about medical preparedness and and help folks kind of make sure they have what they need on hand for any type of situation that could arise. We really appreciate all of this information, man. It's been a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate y'all having me on. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Dr. Hightower or Adrian, as we know him. That was a phenomenal conversation. And also did not know that our friend is kind of the most interesting man in the world. (laughs) But yeah, hopefully it gave you food for thought on what to add to your first aid kits, your emergency kits, your kits when you're out and about to really protect us from a medical perspective. Absolutely. All right, guys, before we go, we want to remind you one more time about our relationship with Jace Medical. If you want to get you some antibiotics or if you want to get 12 month supply of your current prescriptions, check out the link in our show description or on our website and go ahead and order you a case. You can get $10 off with that code Mick and Jen, Jen with two N's again. So <laughs> check that out. And finally, if you're loving the show, please subscribe. Give us five stars wherever you listen or watch. Namaste. Namaste.